So our next topic um, for module one, lecture one, is contraception. We're sort of going in order. Um, preconception, prenatal, um, and then we'll go into labor and delivery and then postpartum. But contraception is an important topic to cover and this is where we do that. Um, so we'll get started. So before we talk about the what and the how of contraception from a nurse's perspective, we are going to talk about the why and that requires a broader perspective like a public health, population health kind of overview. Um, I am going to give you a link to the Healthy People 2020 objective regarding family planning. Uh, it's a very nice page. It's very well written. But if you think about contraception and family planning from a historical per perspective, there have been all kinds of methods of birth control um, because an unintended pregnancy does create stress on a family. Um, and so you might find references if you really research the topic to all kinds of things that were maybe unsafe, definitely not effective. Effective family planning has revolutionized the way that people can live their lives. It has revolutionized the way that women and men can relate. Um, it allows women and men to achieve educational and career goals, which is important, especially when we're thinking about things like urban poverty that determines so much of our health. We can get better health outcomes just by allowing people to rise out of that. Um, it allows couples to control the size of their families and have some autonomy over the way that um, their standard of living proceeds. And it allows for better physical and mental health outcomes for women, infants, and families. The ideal family spacing, this kind of goes with the next point, which is proper birth spacing. Um, ideal family spacing is anywhere from two to five years. If you go much less than that, if you're having your kids less than a year or less than 18 months, you're really putting a strain on the mother's body. And often that subsequent child isn't nourished as well. We have higher rates of preterm birth. We have higher rates of spontaneous loss, um, lower birth weights. And so, you know, it's important for physical health. Women also get um, higher rates of postpartum depression or perinatal depression. Sometimes it doesn't occur postpartum. Um, <clears throat> and also any pre-existing condition can be aggravated by uh, pregnancies that are poorly planned and poorly spaced. It allows for proper birth spacing. Um, it also allows, and I don't think I put this on here, but management of preconceptual uh, conditions. So if a woman has diabetes and we want her to have a healthy pregnancy, she needs to get the diabetes under control before she conceives. Otherwise, she's put her pregnancy at risk um, for a bad outcome. And so contraception, while we're doing all of that, is important. It's also important for mental health. Um, you know, we, we went through psych last year and we saw, you know, that some women's uh, pregnancy is complicated by mental health issues. If we don't have contraception and the woman is taking medication, um, for psychiatric conditions, sometimes the consequences are devastating. Um, if her illness is not controlled before she gets pregnant, she has a chance of a much poorer outcome um, for multiple reasons. Um, so family planning can really allow people to have a much higher quality of life, and it reduces the social and financial cost of unintended pregnancy, both for the individuals involved and for, uh, you know, the population on a whole. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you think about the financial cost of an unintended pregnancy, um, we've got more people who need assistance. We've got more people who need uh, extensive health care when there are poor outcomes. And so family planning is a really important aspect of population health. Now that we've discussed the importance of family planning in terms of individual and population health, let's get into the different methods of contraception. Um, don't worry about looking at all this on one page. As we move forward, we're going to break each one of these down and discuss them individually. So natural methods or situational methods, as your book terms them, include abstinence, which in theory is 100%, however, in practice is much lower due to user error, and I'm sure you can all think of reasons that that might be. Um, we have fertility awareness methods. These 
can be somewhat effective, more effective than random chance, certainly, um, with unprotected sex. However, they do they require a great deal of commitment on the part of the fan of the couple. Um, so, you know, in a lot of education and training, and you know, sometimes bodies do weird things; so they don't always comply with our fertility awareness methods. Um, We'll talk about those a little in a little bit. Coitus interruptus is also known as the withdrawal method, and most of you can understand the concept. It's not completing um, the sexual act where fertilization normally occurs, so sperm never gets to egg, um, in theory. And we'll discuss why that might not be an ideal method if you really don't want to get pregnant. Um, it is in popular usage, though, so be aware of it. Barrier methods, such as condoms, a barrier method provides a barrier, whether it's latex or some other material, um, between the ejaculate and um, the fallopian tube somewhere. Um, so we have condoms, both male and female. There is the diaphragm, which used to be a very popular option, not so much anymore. Um, there is the contraceptive sponge, goes under the brand name of Today. Um, and the cervical cap, which works, they all kind of work along the same principle. They cover the opening of the cervix so sperm can't get through and um, get to the uh, fallopian tube where fertilization typically occurs. And we have hormonal methods, and um, you may be familiar with some of those options. Um, they go, you know, we have the pill, uh, estrogen progestin or progestin only. These are oral contraceptives. They usually need to be taken once a day. Um, ortho-evra, which is a patch, is another combination hormonal method, and the NuvaRing, which um, covers the cervix and releases hormone. And then we have progestin-only contraceptives. I'm covering intrauterine devices and Nexplanon under another category, but they also use only progestin. Progestin is, um, you know, you're kind of mocking, you're, you're blocking the body's normal ovulation signals. Um, so that includes Depo-Provera, which is a three-month injection, um, and the mini pill or a progestin-only OC. We have Lark's long-acting reversible contraception. These include the intrauterine devices. They are placed once. They stay in place for a period of up to, you know, it depends on the actual one, but it could be anywhere from five years to ten years. Um, Paragard's copper device, it releases no hormones. Um, Marina and Skyla both have progestin. Nexplanon is <clears throat> an implanted device. It's little rods that go under the skin. You might see them in clinical because they're doing them right on the postpartum floor, like on day one. And it's, you know, these are really good methods. Uh, long acting reversible contraception. You cut your user error rates down to just about zero. They are reversible. Um, they are immediately reversible. The minute you take a marina out or a nexplanon, that woman is fertile, in theory. Um, she may be five or ten years older, so that you know that comes into play. But from the contraceptive effect, she's not um, any less fertile than she would be. So those are larks. I'll uh, talk a little bit about those. There's permanent contraception, and under that we talk about vasectomy, tubal ligation, sterilization. Um, Tubal ligation still has some failure rates um, if those tubes re anastomose or if we get an ectopic somewhere. Um, vasectomy still has failure, failure rates, particularly if the man doesn't go get checked. So those are considered not as not 100%. Um, when we talk about being absolutely sterile, like a hysterectomy would do that, but it's not performed for contraception reasons. And then there's emergency contraception, and you've probably heard of Plan B. Um, you know, it used to be called the morning after pill, and we'll talk about those as well. So on to the natural methods. We've already discussed abstinence as um, theoretically the ideal contraceptive, but practically not so much. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit more about the fertility awareness methods. The first of which we're going to uh, discuss is the Billings method. Now the Billings method relies on a woman to check the quality of her cervical mucus every day to determine when her fertile window is. Um, so there's a term that I'd like to kind of show you. It's called spinobarket. Um, and it means that the, let me just 
spell the word out so you have it. There we go. Okay, um, so spinobarket refers to a quality of cervical mucus at ovulation in which it becomes very stretchy, very clear, um, like egg whites, and that's the way it's described to women who use this method. So a woman has to be very comfortable with her body and very diligent at checking, and her body has to um, produce clear, obvious signals for this to work. And her partner has to be cooperative with it. He has to respect the fertile window and, you know, they have to abstain from sexual intercourse during that time. Um, this all takes a lot of training too. You can't, this is not a method you would be able as a generalist nurse to instruct your patient in unless you had additional training in it. Um, so let's kind of get rid of the spin of barket there. We won't get rid of it altogether because it comes into play in the next method, which is known as the symptothermal method. And the symptothermal method combines um, the checking of cervical mucus with daily temperature taking first thing every single morning. A woman, before she gets out of bed, drinks a glass of water, um, does anything at all, she is supposed to check her temperature then when she gets up, hold on, I'm trying to add a picture here, just so you can see how much commitment this takes on the part of the woman. I'm gonna make that really big. So look at that fancy chart. Um, she has to take her temperature and check cervical mucus and chart all of this into a chart um, by cycle day. And after she's done that for about three months, sometimes she can predict her fertile window. The problem is, is that the temperature doesn't go up until after ovulation and fertilization often occurs because of a, a intercourse that happens up to three days before ovulation. Um, so she's got to chart this three months in a row. Um, and you can see where the failure rate might come in here. Now, what these methods, the Billings method and the symptothermal method are really good for is finding your fertile window if you do wanna get pregnant. Um, they are not as useful for contraception unless you happen to be in a faith that strictly prohibits contraception. Oh, I forgot one, um, a method. Hold on, let me fix that. Sorry. Love that I can edit though, right while I'm talking. Um, here, I'll move that down a little bit. Okay, so you can see how much commitment this takes on the part of a couple um, and how much record keeping and how much responsibility is on the woman to understand her own fertility. Religions that prohibit artificial methods of contraception um, a lot of times will really encourage, and that's usually the source of education um, for women who use these methods. The calendar method is uh, even less reliable and it's kind of fallen out of favor even in the circle of people that use this for birth control. It certainly isn't really great for um, people who are trying to get pregnant. It's less scientific. Um, those people are probably better off buying ovulation predictor kits which um, detect the presence of FSH in the urine. But anyway, that's sort of a digression. Um, what a woman does is she charts the length of her cycle and determines what her fertile window is and does like five days before and five days after. Now the problem with this is is that ovulation occurs 14 days before the next period starts. Not 14 days after the last one started. And you really, unless your cycle is really like clockwork, it is almost impossible to predict the exact timing of ovulation. Now, if you're leaving five days in either side and you're fairly regular, theoretically you're safe. But look at that, that's an awful lot of days for a happily married couple to abstain from sex, especially if they're also abstaining during menstruation. So you've got like maybe, you know, a few days a month where sexual intercourse can occur and that's just not acceptable to most happily married couples or happily partnered couples. You know, it's just not a thing that most people would want to do. <clears throat> In addition to which, bodies are weird. They do weird things. They catch colds right before finals. They sometimes have twitches or whatever, and sometimes they ovulate on a very unpredictable business uh, basis. So that is sort of the uh, drawbacks to the calendar method. That's why almost nobody uses it. 
Lactational uh, <clears throat> amenorrhea. Be careful with this one, especially on the postpartum floor. Um, a lot of women labor under the delusion that they cannot get pregnant during breastfeeding. Well, on the whole, women ovulate less when they're breastfeeding, um, especially when they are exclusively breastfeeding and breastfeeding happens all through the day and night. Um, but lots and lots and lots of women with very closely spaced children have used the lactational amenorrhea method and it has failed them. Um, especially when you start having a baby sleep through the night, um, which is kind of when you're more at risk for uh, an unintended pregnancy anyway because you've got the opportunity. Um, especially when you start offering solid foods, any reduction in the amount of prolactin that this mom is going to produce and oxytocin um, is going to increase the chances of an unintended pregnancy. Um, so it's not an ideal method, although some people will rely on it. People should be counseled that you might ovulate before you get a period, you know, and you might ovulate while you're breastfeeding and just know that. And if it's if you want to space your kids a little further apart, you need to use a different method. Um, coitus interruptus is listed in your book as a situational method. I alluded to that before, and this is um, a common method among people who really don't plan to have sex, uh, and they find themselves in that situation. It's sort of a, an impromptu way of not getting pregnant. It is not super effective. Um, failure rates are high. A, for, you know, compliance issues, and B, there's a lot of times there is some sperm present before ejaculation occurs. Um, so those are the natural methods. The next item on our agenda are the barrier methods of contraception. Um, most of us are familiar with the male condom that's sort of part of our popular culture because of public health campaigns, and rightly so. They are important for not only individual health, but for population health. We have male condoms and we have female condoms. Let's move some stuff around so that we can focus our discussion. So male condoms are probably the most familiar form of contraception to most people. They are easily available in drugstores. You can get them cheaply. You can actually get them for free in a lot of community health centers, including family planning clinics. Um, but not exclusive to that. It, what's important to remember is that a condom is only as effective as the person who uses it, and we need to provide education as nurses on the proper way to do that. I'm not going to um, go into the whole banana and the condom demonstration. What's important for people to know, and you may have to break it down for them. <clears throat> Number one, a condom is a single-use item. I love this little tweet that the CDC came up with because it proves that they live in the real world sometimes. We say it because people do it. Don't wash or reuse condoms. Use a fresh one for each sex act. Things you think you don't have to tell people. Um, it is a single-use item. It should be used for every single act of intercourse, but it should be a new one every time. Also, um, we need to teach people to leave a little bit of space at the tip, roll down towards the base, and when they are taking the condom off, it's important to hold the base of it so that there's no spillage. Um, other things that are important, you can use male condoms or you can use female condoms. You should never use both together. The friction can cause tearing. They can both break and then you're wide open to infection. Um, <clears throat> it may take a little bit of practice for people to get the hang of using a male condom or a female condom. Female condoms are a little bit more difficult. Um, but there are some really good graphics on the CDC website which you can explore. It's also important to remember that if you need lubricant, you should use it, but it should be water-based and not petroleum-based, like baby oil or hand lotion or Vaseline or any number of things that um, contain oil-based products because that causes latex to break down, and that's you know sort of a risk factor. It's Why bother? If you're going to do it, do it right. Um, so those are your male condoms. Condoms are great when you combine them with other methods of birth control, too. It really increases their effectiveness as a contraceptive. So some condoms are impregnated with um, spermicide, or we can, use, we can advocate for spermicide use with the condom. We'll talk at the end about the combination of condoms and larks, 
uh, long-acting reversible contraception. It's actually a healthy people goal to increase that combination so that we're not having an unintended pregnancy and we're not spreading disease. Um, <clears throat> you really see HIV rates go down in areas where condom use is practiced, where it's promoted. Um, and when HIV was a new infection, it was sort of a game changer. It was the only way we knew to prevent the spread of this disease, um, which at that point in time was very deadly. So um, male condoms, it's very important to know you know, how to use them. Female condoms are also important. Um, side note about that, they were developed by public health experts because sex workers found that it was very hard. You know, when we were talking about developing countries, I think it was World Health Organization advocated for the development of this product, but I'm not entirely sure, so don't quote me. Um, <clears throat> sex workers were using the product because their male clientele refused to put on a condom. Um, the problem with that is, again, it is a single-use item. You know, and there were some issues with, with that. Um, enough said on that subject. So, <clears throat> in addition to condoms, we have some other barrier methods. We have the diaphragm. Diaphragm used to be a very popular method of birth control. It is non-hormonal. It must be fitted by a provider. It must be refitted when a woman gains or loses more than 10 pounds or after childbirth. It must be inserted before sex with a spermicide. Um, let's see if I can find you a good picture of that. There's, there's the diaphragm. Let me kind of circle that. There you go. With the spermicide. Um, it's important to have that ring of spermicide around that kind of seals the edges where uh, sperm can penetrate and get into the cervix through the uterus to the fallopian tubes where fertilization occurs. Um, and next you see the woman folding it, inserting it in her vagina and making sure that it covers the os of the cervix. So that's how you would insert the diaphragm. Hold on, let me just move that. And if you give me a minute, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Whoop. My pictures don't wanna do what I want them to do. Um, in the corner, you can kind of see, I'll just highlight it. It's easier than wasting your time trying to um, move the pictures around. So the diaphragm in the box, <clears throat> they put a quarter in it, and at first I was kind of freaked out, like, what's that for? Um, but it's to give you an idea of the size. It's got, like, sort of a flexible um, ring around it. It's, it's, it'll hold its shape unless you pinch it. Um, but that's the diaphragm. Oops, sorry. Um, things to know about the diaphragm. It needs to stay in at least six hours after intercourse. New spermicide should be applied before each act. Um, and it should be held up to the light periodically to make sure there are no holes, tears, or weak spots in the diaphragm. Um, the diaphragm has a better rate of effectiveness when people use it consistently, like all methods, but it is still not 100% effective. It is not as effective as hormonal methods. It's great for women who are breastfeeding. Um, remember we talked about that lactational amenorrhea method? Well, you know what? If we combine it with a diaphragm, which is non-hormonal, <clears throat> um, we can maybe increase that effectiveness. Uh, so the diaphragm may have some application. It's not a very popular method anymore. Women have to be very comfortable with their bodies to use it. Similar to the diaphragm, we have the sponge. Sponge is available over the counter. It does not need to be fitted. There's a picture of it right there. And you can see it has like a little rubber band. It's like kind of a, an elastic um, inside there so that the woman can kind of pull it out. It can be, it has to be moistened with regular old tap water, um, inserted the same way as the diaphragm. Should cover the os of the cervix. Um, and the spermicide kind of ups its effectiveness. One thing to keep in mind about the sponge, it is relatively cheap. Um, I think I looked it up just for this lecture. $9.50 at Walmart for a box of three of them. It can be left in place for 24 hours and used for repeated acts of intercourse without reapplication of any spermicide. Um, some of the downsides to it are that women who have had children, this is a much less effective contraceptive. 
the efficacy rate goes way down in a woman who has had children before. Um, and again, it's, it's good for somebody who is maybe breastfeeding and their fertility may be somewhat decreased early on especially. They don't want a hormonal method. It's okay for people who smoke. It's probably best if you combine it with a condom for people who are having unpro well, who are having relations that are um, not as stable because it really does not protect very effectively against sexually transmitted illnesses. <clears throat> Similar to the sponge, we have cervical cap or the fem cap. And there's, clean a little bit of that up. Um, there's an image of that. They work sort of the same way. The fem cap, your book describes it as a sailor's cap. I thought it kind of looked like a nurse's hat. Whatever, that's my bias. Um, these kind of fit in by suction. They fit a little bit better than a diaphragm or a sponge. Similar concept. Again, not as popular. A lot of women really don't like this. They feel that it reduces spontaneity. Um, but for some women, this may be an alternative. So now that we've become familiar with the barrier methods, we're going to talk about hormonal methods. They're another really common method of contraception. Um, they must be prescribed by a licensed independent provider, whether that provider is a nurse practitioner, a physician, a PA, or a midwife. They must be prescribed, so they have to come into the healthcare system and be seen and screen for risk factors for complications. Um, we have two basic types. They are the combined hormonal methods, estrogen and progestin, and they are progestin only. We never see estrogen only um, because the cardiovascular risks are too much when you have unopposed estrogen and the dose is high enough to prevent pregnancy. So you'll either see combined estrogen, progestin, or progestin only. Um, all hormonal methods kind of work the same way. They inhibit ovulation, basically. Uh, they kind of override the body's natural hormonal cycle and prevent ovulation. You can kind of see oral contraceptives, everyone knows the pill. Um, those are some sample packs. They're all different types of delivery methods for that. The typical pattern is a 28-day pack where seven days are placebo so that the woman gets in the habit of taking the pill every day um, and doesn't have that week where she might forget and maybe it's instead of seven days, now it's 10 days or 11 days and, and she's not um, protected. So <coughs> that's kind of a typical thing. During the week um, where she's taking the placebo pills <coughs> or not taking pills, she'll have withdrawal bleeding like a period, but that period will be lighter it will involve less cramping, um, and it should involve less PMS. Um, so that's attractive to a lot of women, and it can be a selling point, especially for women with very heavy cycles or women who get very bad cramps. It also regulates the cycle. So you have a, you have a period every 28 days on the dot. For some women, that's great. They can really kind of plan their, you know, they know when their uh, cycle is going to begin. Um, especially women with like PCOS with have, who have very irregular periods, um, the 28-day cycle might be really attractive to them. Um, the important thing to remember about the pill is that it's only effective if you take it, um, and you have to take it on a regular basis. Now, if you skip one pill, a woman should be instructed to take the pill as soon as she remembers, and then take the next scheduled dose. You can take two together. Once you get into two or three days out, you should really start using other methods like a condom to sort of back it up. Um, and then, you know, other delivery methods for the combined estrogen, progestin only, hormonal contraception. We have Evra, which is a patch. This is actually kind of a good um, tool for women who are forgetful. They only have to remember to do it once a week. Uh, if they put on a patch on Sundays, Sundays they take it off. They should be instructed to, you know, apply it to a clean area, just like you do with any um, medication patch. Uh, but it does stay on for seven days. It gets changed out. And then there should be, like, three weeks where you use it and one week where you don't, and that's where that withdrawal bleeding occurs again. Um, very similar to the pill, just not as uh, prone to error. We have Nuvering. Nuvering is similar to OrthoEver, the patch, in that it works for seven days. You put it in once through the vagina, it kind of covers the cervix, it releases hormones through the vaginal mucosa that are absorbed into the body, again, preventing ovulation. 
Um, it should not be noticeable to the woman or her partner during intercourse. Um, women have to be comfortable inserting this and they have to have instruction in it. Um, and some women find that more or less acceptable than others. So, but it's another option we can offer people. Um, things to remember with the combined estrogen progestin pills. Now, in your book on page 88, I'm just gonna refer you to that. And that's in the London text that we use. Um, there's a pretty substantial list of side effects. Not all of them are common, so I'll give you the most common ones. So we have alterations in lipid metabolism, and that's important for any woman with cardiovascular risk factors. Um, we have breast tenderness. Actually, what you have is sort of a mimicking of the signs of pregnancy. So you also can have nausea, particularly when women are getting used to this method. You know, eventually the body kind of figures it out. You can have fluid retention. Although it's really probably not more severe than what women get cyclically. Um, headache, hypertension. So let's, let's do headache. That's more of a troublesome side effect. But women who have migraines might find that completely unacceptable. And it can cause hypertension. It kind of causes a little mild um, metabolic syndrome. So there are some women, and we're going to talk about this. This is important. It's a testable concept. For whom hormonal methods are not appropriate? Who are they? Let me get rid of some of this stuff because you can find that on page 88, as I said. Okay, so who should not be offered an oral contraceptive? We have smokers, particularly smokers over the age of 35. Under the age of 35, pregnancy is actually a bigger risk factor for um, some of the adverse effects. The biggest one of which is DVT and PE, and sometimes stroke. So smokers, especially over the age of 35. Remember that, you're gonna to need to know it. Um, people with history of hypertension. And then diabetes, really uncontrolled diabetes, but over 10 years duration or with vascular complications. And that kind of makes sense. We're talking about DVT, we're talking about PE, we're talking about stroke. and Diabetes is a risk factor independent for all of those things. So we don't want to give women who have um, severe forms of diabetes or women who are have long-standing diabetes anything that could compromise them any further. Um, other people who should not get oral contraceptives are people with a history, and this is kind of one of those duh things, of DVT, PE, or TIA, or CBA. Okay, anybody with a history of blood clots, formation of blood clots, should not get a hormonal method of birth control. That's just that. Okay, so <clears throat> let's give me one second here. So next up are the progestin-only methods, the mini pill. <clears throat> Here's a picture of that. You can see that it has days of the week written on it. Um, the biggest thing about the mini pill that people need to know is that if you miss it by even a few hours, you can trigger ovulation. Um, and if that happens, you are not protected against pregnancy. And that's sort of an obvious fact. However, lives are what they are. Um, so a woman who is not compliant with other aspects, if she's you know really committed to not getting pregnant and she's breastfeeding, for example. Breastfeeding is um, one of the better indications for the progestin-only pill um, because progestin does not appear to block or to reduce milk production in a lactating mom. Um, but if she's highly motivated not to get pregnant, you have to tell her to set a timer every single day because just that difference of a few hours can be the difference between a, an unintended pregnancy and a woman who's protected against that. Um, 
and we have Depo-Provera. Depo-Provera is an injectable, long-acting um, contraceptive. And we give it IM injection every 12 weeks, although it is active for 14 weeks, according to my reading. Um, women should be instructed that they need to keep coming back. Now, one of the big things with progestin-only methods we saw that there were some significant side effects with the combined. Progestin tends to produce more troublesome side effects, and I'm gonna list them there again on page 88, but acne, oily skin, just what every young woman wants. Um, and then we have decreased libido. Again, yay, sign me up. Um, we have depression and fatigue. That will impact your quality of life. We have hirsutism, which is hair in unwanted places. We have increased appetite and weight gain. And then there's an issue of irregular bleeding. Now, the common pattern, and it varies from woman to woman. Let me just put these up so you can see them. Um, the common pattern is that in the beginning when we're giving Depo, she may have prolonged bleeding, breakthrough bleeding, she has more bleeding. And then as time goes on with continued use, we see less bleeding. We might have very small, scant periods, um, far apart, or she might not um, bleed at all. And for some women, this is just not acceptable. Um, so they should be counseled that these are your side effects so that they don't just skip the next appointment and then they don't have anything. Um, so that's kind of important to remember. You know, it. The, this method, like the LARCs, um, decreases sort of the visibility of birth control. So for a woman who is maybe in a relationship with the partner does not agree to her choice of limiting her fertility, um, sometimes you see that in abusive relationships, sometimes you see it in various cultures. Um, she gets a shot of Depo-Provera. The partner doesn't always know. Um, and so she's protected against pregnancy, and yet there are no pills to find. There's no outward evidence that she's using contraception. So for some women, this might be a really good choice. For some women, it might not be a good choice. Obviously, we would prefer that all women be in relationships with partners um, whom they can trust, but sometimes they aren't, and we got to live in the real world sometimes. Um, so that's something about Depo-Provera. And one last note that women should be aware of is that after Depo-Provera, um, there can be sometimes a delay in the return of fertility. It could take them up to 10 months to get their cycles back, um, their ovulatory cycles back. And so if a woman is planning a pregnancy relatively soon, maybe we want to sub out this method for something that's a little more reversible immediately. It is a reversible method. It's just not always immediately reversible. Um, it's also associated with bone demineralization, but in your premenopausal women, it's usually not as um, significant. Um, you can cancel your mom, your uh, women to take vitamin D and calcium and to get regular weight-bearing exercise if you want to. Um, that's important. But uh, those are the major points with hormonal methods. And if I were going to take something home and use it, it is the side effects of hormonal methods and the adverse uh, effects. Who is a poor candidate for these methods? That would be something that you would want to know. Um, because many women are interested in using hormonal methods of contraception. Um, but not every woman is a good candidate for it. It's time to turn our discussion to long-acting reversible contraception, or LARCs. Uh, and these methods are actually pretty revolutionary if you think about it. We've basically taken user error out of the equation. Um, and one study that I read, it was a few years ago, and I don't have the source with me, but um, basically said that the unintended pregnancy rate <clears throat> dropped to the point where it was lower than sterilization. Um, or tubal ligation vasectomy, um, again, because it's really almost foolproof. As long as it's inserted correctly um, and the user is able to tolerate the effects or side effects, um, 
we're in pretty good shape with these. So uh, public health agencies are really pushing to get grants. There is a one-time expense and it's fairly large, but over a period of time they're actually cheaper because things like Paragard can stay in for 10 years, Marina can stay in for five to seven, um, and that sort of depends on a woman's age and her fertility. Uh, Skyla stays in for three, Nexplanon stays in for three. Um, so over a period of three to 10 years, uh, we see actually decreased cost. So this is a good contraception uh, method for people who maybe really should not get pregnant um, for whatever reason or don't want to. The other really big advantage of a lark is that it is right in the name reversible and it is immediately reversible there is a return to fertility as soon as the method is discontinued as soon as we take out that IUD or uh, remove the next one on um, so there are some significant advantages uh, intrauterine devices are becoming much more popular in fact if you ask most OBGYNs what method they use themselves or what method they uh, their wives are using chances are they're going to tell you a marina or Skyla, um, because these methods are very user-friendly. Insertion can be uncomfortable, so you can counsel a woman who is planning to get an IUD to take Motrin beforehand, ibuprofen, um, and that sort of decreases the pain. There's a slight risk of, uh, you know, inserting it incorrectly such that it perforates or um, embeds itself in the uterine wall instead of staying in that sort of nice little cavity there. Um, but that's a small risk and generally uh, proper insertion techniques prevent that. Um, <clears throat> the biggest thing, the biggest difference between the two methods, I'm going to show you a Paragard so you can kind of see what it looks like. You see all the copper surrounding that? Well, it's copper based. It has no hormones. It can stay in for up to 10 years. It does not affect um, fertility in the long term, although, you know, you are 10 years older, theoretically, when you discontinue this method, if you've used it till its end point. Um, people like it because it's hormone-free, so it preserves their natural cycle. People dislike it because it increases cramping and bleeding for some women. It can make the periods heavier. It doesn't make them more irregular, which is what the hormonal IUDs will do, um, but it does make them heavier, and it can make cramping more intense for some women. So, um, you know, Paragard is one device and it is copper based. Marina is, Marina and Skylar both have levonorgestrel, which is a progestone, progestin. Um, and they release in small, steady amounts over long periods of time. Um, and it says it's sort of right in the slide, so I'm going to highlight that for you. Um, shoo, sorry. Okay, so there's your Marina. <clears throat> And because it's releasing hormones and it's also creating a mild inflammatory reaction within the uterus, it thickens cervical mucus to prevent sperm from entering the uterus. It sort of makes that unfriendly environment. Um, so that's its primary mechanism of action. It inhibits the sperm from reaching the egg so it does not get to the outer third of the, you know, the fallopian tube, the ampulla. Um, and it thins the uterine lining. Um, one of the big advantages for a lot of women with Marina, because it thins the uterine lining, we see decreased menstrual bleeding. In the beginning, you might have some irregular spotting or some breakthrough bleeding, but generally there's a lot of women <clears throat> who will not menstruate at all the entire length of time that they're on the Marina, um, which for some women is very freeing. Um, you do not feel the Marina once it's in place. The first couple of days, there is sometimes cramping and tenderness. Um, but after that, really, most women don't even know they're there. Now you'll notice, i blow this up or highlight it or do something to it. Um, down in here, there are some strings. Okay, you can see those. They're like little filaments. Um, I don't have an actual device to show you. Maybe I'll order one one of these days, but um, those little microfilaments are not generally palpable during intercourse. A woman can check them for placement. Um, if you feel them, they usually get tucked behind the cervix in the posterior fornix of the vagina. Um, so they're not really in the way of anything, but you can still access them to check and make sure that your IUD is still in place. 
Um, the risk there is expulsion, um, and we don't want that. But um, it is thankfully rare. There we go. Okay, and I can go back to what we were doing here. Um, Skyla works along the same principles, but the big difference between Marina and Skyla is a size difference. So Skyla is smaller, so it's more appropriate for women who have never had children. Marina is suggested for women who have borne at least one child. When you remove a Marina, a Skyla, or a Paragard, that woman is restored to whatever fertility she would have at that age. Um, IUDs got a bad rap a few decades ago because there was a higher incidence um, for some women of pelvic inflammatory disease secondary to uh, sec you know, a sexually transmitted infection. Um, so an IUD, in theory, um, could maybe accelerate that if it were you know, present. Um, there's a slightly higher chance of ectopic pregnancy. If the woman does manage to become pregnant, the pregnancy will usually implant the tubes because it can't get back to the uterus and there's no uterine, there's a very thin uterine lining with the hormonal methods. Um, but they are very, very effective and we're looking at failure rates of less than 1% um, with the IUDs. And again, this is a contraceptive that once it's in and the cramping subsides in a couple of days, most women don't even know they have it. Now the hormonal um, IUDs sometimes have some minor side effects. Most of the effect of the hormone is local. It acts on the uterus directly, the lining of the uterus, the cervical mucus. Um, but some does get into systemic circulation. So some women have reported weight gain uh, with that, but not as noticeably, you know, the percentages are a lot lower than for people who are taking, say, Depo-Provera um, for contraception. Um, so IUDs are a very valid choice for a lot of women who want to space their families, who may want to get pregnant at some point, just not now. Um, it's, you know, a great method for women who have a couple of kids and they're just not, you know, they maybe aren't in a place where they're going to remember to take a pill every day. It does not interfere with breastfeeding. So IUDs can be a really important um, part of our family planning. And next we have Nexplanon. Uh, let's see, let me get a picture of that up. Sorry for the time this takes. This is a picture of somebody who has one implanted, and you can see it's like not very noticeable under the skin. Um, it requires a minor surgical procedure to insert and another surgical procedure to take it out, um, which limits its effectiveness. Now, those of you who are having clinical rotations at Temple, <clears throat> may see Nexplanon inserted right on the postpartum floor. They do it like day one. Um, and that's a great way to ensure that this woman does not come back pregnant. A lot of our population in Philadelphia is lost to care once they deliver. They don't come for their six week checkup, even though we try to you know, emphasize the importance of that for their health um, and to make sure that they have recovered from you know, the trauma of childbirth or from C-sections, some of them just won't come. Um, at that point, they're kind of wrapped up in taking care of their kids. Um, so they might neglect their own health a little bit, and that's, that's a women's health issue that deserves separate coverage. But anyway, not for this lecture. Um, you can see that it's really not very um, noticeable under the skin. There are little rods that are impregnated with uh, levo norgestrel, another progestin. Um, and this is a method of birth control that has less than 0.2% failure rate. Not just in theory, but in actuality, because you know you can't remove your own next one unless, well, let's not go there. I'm sure there's a YouTube video of somebody doing it somewhere, but it's not a great idea. Most women won't try it. <clears throat> Never thought people would wash condoms either for reuse, but you know, again, outside the scope of this discussion. So um, next one on, is a really good contraception. Some people find it less attractive for the reason that it may sometimes migrate. You have to give them that as part of informed consent in rare events. And it can cause some of the side effects of the more uh, systemic progestins like Depo-Provera, meaning the weight gain, hirsutism, um, ovarian cysts, acne, 
things that may be less acceptable to the patient. But for a patient looking for a contraceptive that she does not need to think about, um, you know, Nexplanon and IUDs are a great idea. In fact, Healthy People 2020 has made it a goal to increase the number of people using larks and condoms in conjunction with condoms. So if you have a high risk patient or a high risk population, it makes sense that we wanna reduce the unintended pregnancy rate and preserve fertility in women who want that. At the same time, prevent sexually transmitted diseases. So for some of those patients in whom an unplanned pregnancy would be bad, you have people with diabetes, hypertension, other risk factors, HIV, things that you wanna get under control Preconceptional, uh, preconceptionally, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and women who are at high risk for sexually transmitted diseases, a lark and a condom is a great combination. Keep in mind that your hormonal methods and your larks <clears throat> do not protect against sexually transmitted infections. Really, the only ones that do that are the barrier methods, and in particular, are male and female condoms. Um, so, you know, this is a really hot topic. You'll hear more about it in clinical. You'll hear a little bit more about it in class. And moving forward, if you get into any area of public health, you will be hearing about LARCs. The problem with LARCs, as I said, is that there's a high initial cost. So if we can subsidize that in some way, um, under the Affordable Care Act, which is subject to change, uh, coverage needs to include contraceptive services, except in certain special circumstances. If you, say, work for a Catholic organization that does not support birth control, um, but coverage needs to include contraception. It's just a very important area of women's health, population health, and as we kind of talked about in the intro material. So increasing access to LARCs is an important goal for um, population health. Okay, and we're gonna briefly cover emergency contraception. It's important to know about this. We've talked about user error kind of a lot. Um, and there are occasions where women aren't planning to be sexually active and yet they find themselves in that situation or they are using contraception and there's a failure of the method. A condom breaks, they miss a couple of pills, um, something happens to suggest that they are not protected from pregnancy after sex has occurred. Um, so there was a lot of controversy about making Plan B over the counter for a long time. You know, the idea was that it was equated with abortion. Um, the truth is, if you get within 72 hours of the act of intercourse, you really aren't looking at a fertilization. You're kind of preventing something before a pregnancy occurs. Um, and we could dissect that a little bit if you want to, um, but there, there was that controversy. The other controversy is that Plan B and Next Choice is like a generic form of it. It's a lot cheaper. It's like, as opposed to $50, it might be $11 at your local Walmart if you need to know that information. Um, <clears throat> having it over the counter reduces the opportunity for women to talk to healthcare providers. It also increases access for women who don't wanna to talk to healthcare providers or who don't have access to one within 72 hours of unplanned intercourse. So there are pros and cons to it being over the counter, um, but as a, as a way to prevent unintended pregnancy, um, having Plan B be affordable, accessible, and having people know that this is an option is important. Now, if somebody is using Plan B on a, you know, more than a few times, then we have to worry about whether the contraceptive, the family planning method she's using is right for her and her partner, or you know, if she has multiple partners. Um, <clears throat> this, we kind of lose that opportunity from, for education. Um, however, if she's coming to the family planning clinic for Plan B, um, maybe because of a cost issue or whatever, um, we can start to talk to her about different options. Um, plan, it's not 100% foolproof. People still will have a pregnancy sometimes after they've used these methods. It's important for people to know that they can access these. Uh, plan B is 72 hours. There's another one that's available by prescription only called Ella, um, and that one can be used within five days of unprotected intercourse or under protected intercourse, as the case may be. Um, <clears throat> there's a time issue here though. And the further out you are from the actual act of intercourse, the less effective these methods are. 
Um, again, they do not protect against sexually transmitted infections. So if a woman is making maybe some lifestyle choices that are not in her best health interests, um, if she's got multiple sex partners and she's not using a condom, um, or her partner is not using a condom, she's not protected against sexually transmitted uh, infections. And people should know that when they get this education. But knowing about Plan B should be something that we um, facilitate as healthcare providers, just so people have that option. The other form of emergency contraception, and it's really not as common, you can insert a copper IUD paraguard within five days of unprotected sex, and that is like the most effective method. Unfortunately, it's also the most expensive method of emergency contraception, and it's, it, you know, I mean, it's not always easy to insert them and reinsert them. So unless the woman is, you know, sort of in the market for a long acting reversible contraceptive, um, a LARC that could be effective for up to 10 years, um, this might not be the issue for her. I mean, the contraceptive method that you want to push. Um, but that's emergency contraception. If you want to know more about any of these topics, I strongly encourage you to go on the CDC's website. They have a lot of really good information about this stuff. Healthy People has some information, but more of their information is about what we as healthcare providers should be um, looking at. <clears throat> Uh, but that's emergency contraception in a very basic nutshell. I mean, there's you could go on about it, but um, that's what you need to know. Okay, so the last topic we're going to talk about is operative sterilization. Um, these are considered to be permanent methods of family planning. When a family is certain that they do not want more children, this is often presented as an attractive option, and people do have their tubes tied or have vasectomies um, fairly commonly um, when they're at that point in their life that they have decided they no longer want children. Um, so there are methods for men and methods for women, or a method. So I'm going to show you a picture of tubal ligation. We'll talk about that first. So tubal ligation disrupts the pathway from sperm to that outer one-third of the fallopian tube, the ampulla, where fertilization occurs. <clears throat> it doesn't affect the menstrual cycle. It doesn't affect hormones. Um, it is a surgical procedure, minor. Usually it's done laparoscopically. Sometimes it's done open, especially for women who are obese. Um, <clears throat> it does carry some risks that are inherent to all surgeries, bleeding or infection. The biggest teaching point that you need to get across, and you need to make sure that it is part of informed consent. If the woman is not English speaking, you must make sure that she understands it in her native language, that there was a translator line used. This is irreversible. Um, there may be ways to get pregnant when you've had a tubal, uh, for example, IVF, intro vitro, vitro, sorry, in vitro fertilization, um, where in, embryos are implanted into the uterus and we bypass all of this other machinery, but it's not something that should be taken lightly. So when you have people who aren't sure whether they want an irreversible method of contraception, if you phrase it to them, if something happened to your kids or your partner and you <clears throat> found yourself in a situation where you were childless or you had a new partner who desired children very strongly, would you regret this decision? And if they say, absolutely not, I want it anyway, um, then you know they're good candidates for the procedure. Um, people who are sort of sitting on the fence, um, it may be a better idea to, put, to propose long-acting reversible contraception, but most people know when they're done with their family, so this is an option for a lot of people. Um, this picture here shows filchy clips. We do, you know, fair number, whoops, sorry, of tubals on the floor that I work on. Um, and I'm going to kind of highlight what the filchy clip looks like. It's there, and it's there. Um, and they're little metal clips. They're like clamps, <clears throat> and they block that pathway. Um, other providers might, depending on the surgical technique they were trained in, tie, cut, and cauterize. Um, the only failure rate that happens, and it does fail occasionally. I have actually seen women come in to give birth after tubal ligation. Um, sometimes the tubes will re-anastomose. <clears throat> Less common with filchy clips than with the older method of tying, cutting and tying. Um, 
it can happen. It doesn't generally. Um, but that is tubal ligation. Again, women should be counseled that it is a surgery, that they will, uh, it's, a, it's not as major a surgery as a C-section will say. Uh, it can be done during a C-section. It can be done postpartum when the uh, uterus is still enlarged enough that you can see the tubes. Um, but it should be considered absolutely permanent and it is a surgical procedure. Um, so let's get that out of there. And then we have vasectomy. Vasectomy is another um, method. This is for the male. Let's get that picture up here. And it is a big picture, sorry about that. And you can see it doesn't affect sperm production or sexual function in any way. Ejaculation, there will still be semen, it just won't have sperm. Um, because the tubule that conducts the sperm into the seminal um, vesicle, well, into the urethra, um, has been cut. So it is a surgical procedure. It is considered a minor surgical procedure. They show you where the incisions take place in the scrotum. I'll highlight that for you in case you were really super interested. So right down here, there's like two very small cuts, um, and they'll go in and they'll... Um, cut the tubes right about there. Um, what is important for the man to know? There's a few things that are important for the man to know. It should not impair his sexual function. It will not impair hormone production. However, um, one of the biggest problems with this is that there is still sperm present um, for, I'm gonna quote your book here, and that information can be found on page 90 for those of you who wanna search for yourselves. Um, it takes about four to six weeks and six to 36 ejaculations to clear um, those pathways, the vas deferens of sperm, of viable sperm. So there's a window of time after the surgery where they may still get a woman pregnant. <clears throat> and they should be checked. They should be checked at six and 12 months to ensure that fertility has not been restored by what your book terms recanalization, that means that these tubes kind of grow back together. That's what happens in the tubules that fail, by the way. So <coughs> as a method, it's actually slightly, slightly less effective than um, Nexplanon or Marina, but definitely much more effective than most other uh, reversible methods of contraception. Um, and if a man gets checked to make sure that his seminal fluid does not contain sperm, then, um, you know, they can be fairly well assured that pregnancy will not occur. Um, again, should be counseled um, that that's a permanent procedure. Um, there is some discomfort. It's one of those things a lot of men will have the procedure done on Fridays. A lot of doctors will schedule a bunch of them on Fridays um, because they can recover over a weekend. It's, you know, ice and rest um, and kind of sitting in a recliner chair. But it is certainly... And maybe you'll have to chastise me for my sexist attitude here. I think it's certainly a lot less traumatic than what women go through when we deliver children um, through our genitalia. Um, and it's, you know, it's not typically a complicated procedure in terms of surgical risks of bleeding or infection. Um, but men should be given informed consent about what that procedure will feel like. So I just want to thank you again for, you know, investing the time into this video. I hope that it pays off for you and I appreciate any and all feedback. Um, so let me know. Thanks and I'll see you in class.